All right. Um, few things that we did on this page last time. We created a link to it to another page that we had created. This one. And we created a pay a link back. All right. Um, we also created an image and we created an external CSS file. So let's take a minute to review those three things. The external CSS file, we accomplished this way. We created a file that contains our CSS code. Now notice when you do this, you don't need to put the CSS tag in. All right. If you include your CSS in the same file as the HTML, you need the style tag to tell the browser that, hey, this is an HTML code, this is CSS code. But when you do it this way, you don't need to tell the browser that. You, you've already told it a, a different way that this is CSS. To review CSS again, two parts. There's a selector, and then there is a list of attributes. And again, we've touched on a few attributes, and I, I suggested that you uh, try an experiment. Um, look up different CSS you can do and, and experiment with it on your pages. We will talk about a lot more CSS, but in the meantime, it's good to try to familiarize yourself with some of the other options that you have. So the selector defines what gets the rule. The attributes are the name of the attribute, a colon, the value of the attribute, and then a semicolon, and then you have the next attribute. And so on. All right. Now, we create a link to it. It's, it's different than a hyperlink to click on and all that, but it's, it's also called a link. And you use this syntax. Link type equals text CSS, rel equals style sheet, style sheet. That will mostly be the same for your basic style sheet. And then you have an href that says the name of the style sheet file. You actually can have more than one style sheet file uh, for a web page, and uh, that, that's especially relevant when you start talking about displaying a page on a mobile device. Or if you want a different style sheet when you print the page versus when you display it on the screen. For example, uh, a lot of news articles, um, if you go to print them on the web, the layout for print is a lot simpler than the layout for, that's displayed on the screen. They get rid of images and so on and so forth. You can do all that via CSS. So you can have a print version of it if a person wants to print out the article. And you can have a display version when the people display it on the screen. So it is possible to have more than one style sheet per file. And, and later on, we will see an example of that. All right. So that's one thing that we reviewed last time about how to create this file and put our style code in there. Um, we also created a link to another page. And again, assuming that everything is in the same folder, we simply say a href equals, and then we have the name of the file. Don't need the HTTP in front of it. You don't need anything else. If it is one of your pages that you've created and it's in the same folder as the other page, you simply put the name of the file in there as the href. Finally, the image tag was a tag that we covered last time. Image src equals possum.jpg, alt equals a picture of a possum. With each image, uh, you're going to have both a source attribute and an alt attribute. The source attribute specifies as the name of the file. Again, on a given website, you may have hundreds of pictures. So you have to specify which picture you want to display, and that's done via the source attribute. The alt attribute is a little snippet of a description so that people that are accessing the page via a screen reader, that is people who are visually impaired, can understand what that picture represents. All right, at least they have an idea of what it is. Any questions about this? We talked about ways to obtain a picture 
And again, the, the key thing of that is we want to do that via legal means. All right, and we want to respect copyright. In an educational context, because you're doing assignments for class, it's a lot more flexible. You can just take images off the web, um, provided you don't uh, take an excessive amount of them. And there's a handout that describes uh, in week one what you're allowed to take. And you, you just have to give credit and say where you've gotten the image, and you'll be OK. All right? Um, if you're de developing a, a, a website that you're actually going to put on the, the internet, the copyright is, is more restrictive. All right? You own the copyright of any picture that you take. So if you've taken the picture, you're allowed, you're allowed to use it. Um, you can hire people to take pictures for you. And you, know, you can hire a photographer if you don't have the equipment um, to take a picture. You can use what are called stock photo services. And stock photo services are just photos that are out there um, that professional photographers take and sell. Um, let's go out real quick to one. I'll just Google for stock photos. And we'll go up here. And you can search anything that you want. So let's search for possum. See if they have any possum pictures. And they do. Oh, look at this one. Ooh. Now, these you have to purchase. Um, one thing that has happened uh, because of the internet is the price of stock photography has gone down quite a bit. Back in the old days before the internet, um, there was also stock pictures to use for like magazines and advertisements and brochures. And photographers could make a good living by having a good portfolio of stock images that they sold to prospective clients. Well, the old supply and demand thing happened. And with the internet, there is a much greater supply of people that take images and therefore the price has come down. But stock photos you have to pay for. Um, Typically, you would want to look, if you're looking for a website, for a stock photo that's described as royalty-free. And royalty-free means that you, know, the, you pay a flat amount to use that picture. You don't, um, you don't have to pay, like if you were to use it in a book, you wouldn't have to pay for every copy of the book that you printed. You just pay one flat amount for that. Um, but that's another way that you could obtain pictures. Uh, a final way is to look for things uh, licensed under a Creative Commons license. Um, and again, what that is is the, the creator of the photograph has um, um, voluntarily, I won't say given up their copyright, but has given sort of a blanket permission for people to use their work. Um, and they can put some restrictions on it. Most often times you will have to um, give a citation saying where you've gotten the photo from. Lastly, very old pictures are what are called in the public domain. So if you, wanted to take, uh, if you wanted to show one of the very famous pictures of President Lincoln that was taken a long time ago, uh, that's over a certain number of years old. And again, I don't know that number off the top of my head. But therefore, it's not subject to copyright law. It's just considered, you know, anyone can use it uh, free and clear. One thing I said to review about images is you always want to save the original so that you can, um, if you edit it and make a change, don't like that change, you can always go back to the original and redo it. That's especially critical if you make a smaller version of the, of the image. You can't go from small to big. You can easily go from big to small. All right. One other thing that you can use background images for, or images for, is you can use images as backgrounds for things. And you have to be very careful when you do this, because you can make a page that looks really great, but you run the risk of making your page difficult to read. All right? So for example, this is a great picture. It's a gigantic picture, but it's a great picture. I might want to make that the background of my whole web page. So I'm going to go in the paint with this guy. And I am going to make 
make a version of it that's approximately as big as my screen. And I'm going to go and save it as, again, I'm, I'm keeping a copy of the original. So if I, if I don't like what I've done, I can always go and go back to the original. And I'm going to call it Possum BG for background. I can now go into my CSS and along with background, I can also give I can give uh, in addition to that or instead of that, I can give a URL and I can specify the name of the image, possum possumbg.jpg. And now, when I go and view the page, That becomes a background image for it. And that kind of looks good, but again, let me let me turn off the lights to make, make the screen a little easier to read. That kind of looks good, but if you notice, it renders the screen a little difficult to read. All right. Like where, you know, where the the text is up against the, the light colored fur, it's easy to read, but when it goes across its eyes and across the gray fur, it becomes more difficult to read. There's a couple things that you can do to correct that. All right. Uh, one of the things that you could do is you could use a photo editing, uh, a piece of photo editing software to sort of fade out the image a little bit. Um, like in Word, you would call that like a watermark where the image is there, but it's a very sort of faded version. Let's see if we can do that. Okay. And I'm going to keep a copy of this because, again, I'm going to edit it. And I might want to undo the edits. see that option in paint. Um, let's open it up in another application. Oh, here's a really good uh, application which is free and open source. It's called GIMP. And GIMP stands for New GNU Image Manipulation Program. GNU is an open source uh, license. Um, what do I mean by open source when I use the phrase that something's an, op an open source software? Any answers? Any ideas? Yes. Anybody can uh, go in. Right. Um, right. With open source, you actually you can, you can get the code and you can customize it any way you want. And you can submit those to the people that sort of are running this particular piece of software. And it can get incorporated into the ultimate re uh, release. So it's kind of software that's written by committee. And uh, most open source or much open source software is free. All right. So GIMP for photo editing is something that you can use that is free. And it, it has functionality comparable to Photoshop. And again, Photoshop is a great tool. Uh, maybe some of you have used it before. But Photoshop is also a little bit expensive. Yes? Yeah, I want you to know, last year my digital imaging class, I've used Photoshop. And yes, I agree, it is very expensive. Yes, it's very expensive. Well, the GIMP is uh, software that does pretty much most of the functionality of Photoshop. And it's absolutely free. Um, it's taken a little bit of time to load here, but um, we'll be able to go in and uh, fix it uh, however we uh, want to fix the image. All right, so I'm going to go in here 
and I'm going to go under colors, brightness and contrast. I'm going to make it bright and low. Uh, we'll keep the contrast there. So notice what I did is I sort of faded out the image. So it's kind of like a watermark. We'll do it. Well, there we go. And I'll go and save this. And now notice that the text is, for the most part, readable. And yet you can still see the image behind it. So you can do a neat effect like that with background images. All right. So that's one thing that you could do to use a background image if you're concerned about interfering with the text. The other thing that you can do, and I'm going to go and undo that change and resave it. get back to how it was originally, is you can actually sort of put this code on a, on a white background. So I'm going to go and I'm going to make header, have a background of white. I'm going to remove the H to article back up. Oh, I already have a rule for header. All right. Now, the only problem there is that it, you can sort of see the image, but it sort of is mostly blocked out. Uh, one thing that you can do to sort of uh, mitigate that a little bit is to uh, change the transparency of the background or the opacity of it. Um, and let's Google opacity to see how you change it in CSS. This is a new property in CSS3, and I can specify an opacity, and I can give a number between 0 and 1. 0 would, uh, for opacity would be completely transparent. So if I set the opacity to 0, you wouldn't be able to see it at all. If I set the opacity to 1, it would be a solid color. If I set it somewhere between there, it'll be partially see-through. So I can go on each of these and say opacity zero point five. And what that will do is that will make the background color white, but it'll sort of be see through white. All right, so there we can, we sort of get the best of both worlds. That image is there, uh, and yet um, you, uh, you can still read it uh, because the, 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 there's a sort of a transparent, a semi-transparent um, block behind it. Questions about this so far? Yes? No, if we scroll it down, it actually, I cheated just a tiny bit here, all right? I made the, I made the image match the, uh, the, pretty much the approximate size of the screen, which is not really, um, which you can do, but you run into the difficulty that some people might have a much bigger screen than this. Um, what images do is that, is that they tile. 
And by tile, it means it would repeat. So if I had a much bigger screen or if I had a much longer page, I would then get a second copy of the image and a third copy of the image and so on. Now you can control that via CSS. You can tell it not to repeat so you only get the one image and then you can set a background color for the rest of the page. All right. Another thing that's done that takes advantage of the tiling aspect of it is you can use what are called um, tile images. Um, if you've ever like done tile on a floor or tile on, on like a, a, a bathroom wall or something like this, if there's a pattern on a tile, the pattern is arranged such that each individual tile sort of lines up with each other tile and it forms a bigger pattern. Um, so like for example, just to draw something real simple, If I had a real simple pattern like this, an individual tile might have a pattern that looks like this. Well, when you line all those tiles up, the individual patterns sort of line up and you get a bigger pattern. All right. So you can, you can make these. There's tools that allow you to make these. Or you can find uh, examples uh, of them online that, again, people allow you to use. And sometimes they want a credit for it. Sometimes they just want you to, to give a, a link to their website. Um, so let's, let's look up CSS background tiles. Here's actually a, a, a page that allows you to generate a tile or to draw a tile. Um. Here we go. Here's a list of tiles that you can download. Uh, let's let's pick this one. I'll click download. It's gonna give me a zip file. I'm going to expand the zip file. Let me close some of these windows. The image is a PNG image. I'm going to copy that into my folder. And then I'm going to change my CSS file to say background, what was the name of it again? Cloth.png. And now if we view the page, we get that pattern going on underneath it. If we look at the individual image, 
the individual image is simply one section of that tile. Just one section of it. And getting back to your question, it repeats. So it lines it up next to it both horizontally and vertically. Now you can change that by saying no repeat if you don't want it to repeat. Or repeat horizontal, repeat vertical. But this forms that. So this is some. This is a nice technique that you can kind of use to uh, um, give a background and give a little more visual interest to your page without having a big, complicated uh, background image that may be difficult uh, to read behind. So this is another thing that you can sort of do um, with that. All right. So notice that's a very subtle pattern. All right. It doesn't really get into the way of that. You can still see it, and yet it makes the page look a little more interesting. Now, you can put a pattern, um, you can put a pattern not just on the whole body, but on a section. So, for example, I could just put this pattern on, instead of on the entire body, I could put this pattern on the header. And then I just get that pattern along there. All right. As we get more into CSS, you will learn a dazzling amount of things that you can do to the page. But you always want to be careful that you're doing it in a way that's going to make the page um, easier for people to see, um, make it more attractive, but more importantly, make it um, so that your page is well organized. And use these things not just uh, because they look good, but because they help the user sort of visually organize the page. All right? And something like that is a good technique. That makes that header sort of stand out. All right? um, and so people can easily see that that is the, um, that is the um, you know, header of the page. Um, generally speaking, there's three kinds of images. I kind of forgot to mention this, but when I downloaded that PNG, uh, it reminded me. Uh, the three kinds of images that you can use on web pages are .jpegs, GIFs, and PNG. Generally speaking, JPEGs and PNGs are better for photographs than, than GIFs are. So if you have a photograph of something, you would want a JPEG or a PNG. A GIF is better for sort of like a line drawing or a logo or something like that, something that doesn't involve a lot of colors. GIFs and PNGs have the ability to have a portion of the image transparent. Whereas JPEGs, there's no transparency. But those are the three image types that are allowable on web pages. Any questions over any of this? Again, we move, we move fast in, in, in summer semester. Um, and really, if you think about it, you know, we've made a lot of progress in the week and a half, or almost two weeks that we've had in this class. Um, we're now making pages that, if they're not beautiful pages, at least they're something beyond the rudimentary black font on a white background. And, we know how to use images. We know how to use links. We know how to do some CSS to make the page look more attractive and to help visually organize it for the user. So we really made a lot of progress. A lot of what we're going to do uh, in the second half of the semester, or not the second half of the semester, but from, from this point on, is to we're going to still learn HTML. We're going to learn a lot more CSS. And we're going to talk about how to use the things that we know and that we learn to effectively communicate a message. All right. Um, one of my pet peeves about web design is when people talk about web design, they focus strictly on the appearance of the page. All right. 
they talk about things that you can do to make the web page look good. Now, that is an aspect of, the web, of a web, of web design, but that's not the only thing in web design. Because you don't just want pages that look good, but you want pages that um, serve some purpose and help people get done what they need to do. All right, so that's also a goal of web design. So um, you're gonna, you have an assignment um, for uh, the next week's assignment. Well, maybe we'll talk about that later. I, I don't want to. I don't want to go over that now. I, I want to just continue on this thought. All right. What are some characteristics of a well-designed page or website? Can anyone think of a website that they think is really well designed, or think of a website? that is really poorly designed. Okay, what was the first thing that you said? Okay, well designed. Visually pleasing? I know that means Absolutely. And um, the second thing you said is that there's sort of a flow. Flow from one aspect to another. Sort of makes Between sections, logical, etc. Yeah. How many of you have been on the website for Barbies, Barbie dolls? How many of you have been on that website? None of you. Yeah, uh, I'm not fan of Barbie. I've only been on websites for superheroes and monsters. Oh. Excellent. What color do you think the Barbie website is? It's probably pink. Let's see if we're right. Okay. <laughs> well, looky here, there is a lot of pink on it. That was that Wonder Woman I saw. That was indeed Wonder Woman that you saw. But as you can see, there's a lot of pink on this site. There is. The Barbie collection. Wow. We knew that without even looking. Anyone a fan of heavy metal music? I am. Who's your favorite band? I'm a fan of ACDC, Guns A's Roses. Okay, ACDC. What color do you think their website is? What was that? Probably black. black. Yeah. Yeah, just like the name of their song. Black and back and black. All right. Wow. Whoa. Look at that. Yeah. So, without visiting these sites, all right, we were able to guess what their basic color scheme was. What does that tell us about the notion of the site being visually pleasing? It's based on the audience. Right. That is one of, the, was one of the key things, is that when you are talking about the design of a website, you are typically talking about a specific audience. Now, there's some websites that the, the, the audience is pretty much everyone. What would be an example of a website that the, the, you know, is, is pretty much the audience is the entire world? Wikipedia, Wikipedia. Google. All right. What kind of designs do they have? Do, are they in pink? Are they in black? No, they're very basic, white background, white uh, or black font. All right. 
So anything that we say about the design of a page has to be viewed through the lens of who the audience is. It's a fundamental rule of any sort of communication, right? If I was going to give this lecture to a group of middle school students, I would do the lecture a little bit different. Why? Because my audience is different. If I was going to give this to a lecture to a group of experienced web designers, I would change the lecture up a little bit as well. All right? So first rule of any sort of communication is to know your audience. And therefore, things like visually pleasing, a logical flow, all of that depends on the audience. So the interesting thing is, is that we really can't come up with some hard and fast design rules because everything is situational and everything depends on the specific problem that we're trying to solve and the specific audience that we're trying to reach. We can, however, come up with some guidelines all right, and say that these are the things that we usually want to do to create a well-designed web page. But they're only guidelines. Okay? Um, one example of a guideline of a well-designed web page is that a well-designed web page, it should be obvious at a glance what the page is about. All right? Right. So you go to Cleveland State's web page, it should be obvious that you're on Cleveland State's web page and not Tri-C's web page or not some other sort of web page. All right? But even that's a guideline. There are times when you might not want to do that. And I'll give you a classic example of a website that it wasn't obvious what kind of website you were on, at least not at first. I know the projector's off. I want to take a second to find the. Here's a website called ilovebees.com. Has anyone ever been on this website? Uh, no. Okay, not yet. No beekeepers in the, in the house, huh? When you go to the site, now this is going to happen pretty quick because this is an older website. And this is a website that, uh, in the old days, it took a minute to load. But we got these fast uh, internet connections now, so things happen pretty quick. But watch what happens. You go to the site. Looks like a beekeeping site in the background. There's a little dancing bee. There is I Love Bees, Margaret's Honey, Nappy Valley, California. And you get something that looks like an error message. Looks rather ominous. And you click on this. Well, the queen was distracted. I snuck into her workshop. Oh, this is an audio file. There's an audio file there. MIA. Recruits. I don't know about you, but it's not obvious to me at first glance what this site is about. Any ideas what I Love Bees is about. Not a beekeeping site. That's, that's, that's the first hint. What do you think it is? It was a viral marketing site for 
one of the versions of the game Halo, the video game Halo. All right. So they created the site, they put it out there, they probably seeded some discussion forums, you know, the people that made this, with posts about this. And they used it to sort of get interest in the site because the, the, the audio files and the, the text files and all that sort of sets up the story of Halo. And they did that in a very clever way. They did that by making people want to know what is this all about and to create suspense and, and so on. So there's an example of a website that violates what I would say is a very solid web design guideline that you should identify your site's purpose in a very obvious way. They did the exact opposite of that, but they had a different purpose. They had a different audience and they, had, they were after something else. They were after creating a sense of mystery and confusion and intrigue and interest about the site. All right. So that's why I say I can't come up with any, I can't come up with many cut and dried web design rules. I can simply say that there are some guidelines. Now, to be sure, if you are doing a website for a CPA firm, you're not going to create an I love corn website and, <laughs> and, and, and do the same sort of thing, right? Because if you're looking for an accountant to do your taxes, you don't have time to play around with games like that, right? To try to figure out what a website is about. However, people that are into video games and into things like that are often intrigued and want to figure something out and get to the bottom of that and all that. And they have a lot of time to do that. So it was a great design for, uh, for uh, the Halo game. It would be a poor design for everything else. So for a typical site, for a typical business, yeah, you want to follow the guideline of, uh, of making the site identifiable instantly. Does anyone else have an example of a well-designed website or a characteristics of a well-designed website, or the, the the opposite. What makes for a bad website, or do you have an example of a bad website? Clear Pardon me. Clear pathing. Clear pathing. Now, what do you what do you mean by that? Okay. Okay, all right. So I would, uh, I, I would put some, some, another way to say some of these things. I would, I would say logical um, organization, good navigation, and consistency. It wouldn't be a good it wouldn't be good design, for example, if you had a link called help on one page and you had a link a link to the same page called contact us. Someone seen as liable to think they're two different pages, right? So you would want to be consistent in the terms. You would want to break down the pages in a logical way, in a clear way. Um, and you would want to make it sure what the navigation is. And you can do that through certain visual techniques, like by the use of color, by the use of things like that to emphasize it. Um, this is getting to, again, why we use these things. We can learn in CSS from now to the end of the semester all the great things we can do. That's the technical part of web development, how you use the languages. The design part of web development is how to use the languages well. All right, and so we can learn CSS, we can learn HTML, but knowing how to put together a good web page, that comes with the design aspect of it. And it's like two sides, you know, they have to be balanced for your website to be successful. Your website can be technically competent, but if it's designed poorly, it's not going to be successful. All right. Um, Clear pathing. I, I like the way that you, you said that. Um, 
uh, but just like beauty is in the eye of the beholder, clarity is in the eye of the beholder, right? So clear to who? Clear to who? Well, visually pleasing to who? The audience. Clear to who? Also the audience. I'll give you a good example of this, a real world example from here at Lorain County Community College. You are taking a CISS course right now, CISS 216 Web Development. What division is the CISS department in? Does anyone know? It's business, right? Close. It used to be in business. Right now it's in engineering, business, and information technology. We merge divisions. A person coming from the outside into Lorraine Community's website shouldn't have to know how we've div div divided our, our stuff. Because there's some places where the computer classes are in a business division. There's some, time, uh, some places where computer classes are in the engineering division. And there's some schools where computer classes are in the math division. There are even here at LC some classes in arts and humanities division. So if you were a student coming in and you wanted to take courses in computers, if that's all you knew that you were interested in computers, you shouldn't have to know what divisions that you wanted to check out. All right? You shouldn't have to know that I, I'm interested in computers so I should check engineering or I'm interested in computers so I check business. Someone that works at the college knows all that, understands that. But outsiders, the audience for the website, doesn't know how we at Lorraine Community College have divided our departments. And they shouldn't have to know. They should just know that, gee, I'm interested in computers. Here's, uh, here's, um, the, uh, here, you know, here's, here's all what my options are. Now again, I'm not trying to say that our website is the best in the world. But this is one thing that we did make an improvement on. Let me try to pull up the page. We have a computer and IT pathway page. And this contains things from actually several different divisions. And several different departments within those divisions. Interactive and digital media, for example, is largely in arts and humanities. Network systems is within LC, and it's also within the University of Akron partnership, and so on down the line. So we did a good job making at least this improvement to the website, whereas you don't have to know how LC devises departments to, uh, to, to understand how, um, uh, how to find something related to information technology um, programs here at LC. So we have an example of a good website or a bad website. Let's Google bad websites. I know I turned the projector off.
Oh, here's a classic of bad web design. <laughs> Obviously. Doesn't look like the kind of website I would go to. No, thank you. What's uh, wrong with this website? It's cluttered. It's cluttered. That's the okay. problem. Is. It has animation that's going on. And. It's animation that's going on without rhyme or reason. And I'm going to, yeah, yeah. Oh, look at this guy. What's wrong with having all that animation on the page? It's distracting. OK, what's the same thing that's wrong with being cluttered is that it's distracting. Keep in mind, anything that you have on the page could potentially take away from everything else on the page, right? If you have one thing on your page, if you have one, one image on your page, then people are going to see that image. If you have 100 images on your page, people might miss them. So therefore, part of design is to make sure you really are identifying what truly is important and focusing on that. Comes down to all the things that we said before, organization, uh, logical organization, and so on. Besides being distracting, there's actually a worse impact for animation. Is anyone aware of what that is? Worse than being distracting. It's why I took it off the screen. Yeah, it, it, animation can trigger seizures. Uh, yeah, in some cases. Um, animation will make the page longer to load. All right. Does this mean that you never use animation? No, but you use animation where it makes sense to use it, all right? And you don't just throw random things out there because it looks cool or it was fun to develop and so on, all right? I did, I did a, a presentation on um, web accessibility and web design once, and there was a tool that allowed me to make a flaming logo, all right? There was an old IBM commercial where they made fun of flaming logos. And it actually was a logo that the fire was burning, and I had my words that were, that were blazing and all that. I'll tell you, that was so much fun to create. I probably spent more time creating the flaming logo than I did on the rest of the presentation, because it was just so much fun. All right? The problem is, is you're not developing a website for your amusement. You're developing a website to communicate things. All right? Um, one of the examples I give for a well-designed website is good old Google. You might say, what is good about Google? All right, why do you think I would classify this as a well-designed website? It is simple. What's the advantage of being simple? What's good about being simple? To the point, I can't possibly get confused, right? There's one text box in the screen, and the cursor is in that text box, so I know where to type if I'm going to Google something, all right? There are two buttons, all right? That's adding a little bit of fun. There's one very simple image. Every once in a while when there's a special day, they add a little bit of visual appeal to it to, by, by putting in like a special logo like on the 4th of July or, or Christmas or whatever. They, they change the logo to make it uh, a little bit of fun. There are other things that you can do here, but they're sort of hidden. Why? Because most people coming to Google are, are coming there to do a Google search. And therefore, it's easy for the user to do what they want to do on that page. And that's why I would say that's, that's well designed. So sort of in a nutshell, I would say the, the, the criteria for what makes a page well designed is if the users of the site can easily accomplish what it is they intended to do. All right? 
And that's, in my mind, as big a part of web design or bigger part of web design than the way it looks and so on. So for your project, you will um, des first design the site and then you will actually create the site. So let's look at the process that I want you to go through to do this. And there are variations of this process, but the process of developing software is, is very similar regardless of the kind of software that you, that you uh, are, are, are creating. All right? In general, the process looks like this. You plan, the web, you plan the website or the software. You create the software. You test the software. You implement. And then you maintain. So you figure out what you need to do. You do it. You test it to make sure that it works. You actually make it come alive. You put it out on the web once you are certain that it works. And then you periodically make changes to it. And software development from the beginning of time has gone through this process. And the interesting thing is, is that whether you follow these steps or not, you are going to go and do all these steps. All right? You can either do them on your own terms or you're going to be forced to do them by someone else. Like, for example, I could skip planning and say, oh, I know what to do. I don't need to plan this. I'm just going to go and create. So I'll create the website. Then you could say, I am perfect. I never make mistakes, so there's no need for me to test my work. So I'm going to skip that and go right to implement. Well, guess what? Your victims or users are going to be doing the testing for you, all right? And they're going to tell you what's wrong. And then you're going to have to go back and figure out what you should have done in the first place and do it and so on. And so all these steps are going to get done, all right? So since they're all going to get done anyhow, you might as well take control and do them in the proper way. Now, here's a graph I'm going to draw that talks about the cost of changing software versus the stage of the process where you find that there's a problem. And if you think about this, it makes sense. The cost of changing software increases the further along the process you get into, which makes sense, right? If I'm planning what I'm going to do, and I realize that as part of my planning that I forgot something, it's pretty easy to correct it, all right? It's pretty easy to go back and correct it and say, oh, yeah, I forgot I needed to do this too. Um, okay, let's go and put that, um, let's go and, and, and figure out how to do that. As you go through the process, the further on that you go, the cost goes up. And notice that this curve is curving upwards, which means it doesn't just increase. It increases at an increasing rate. So it keeps going up and up and up, and it keeps getting increasing by a greater amount each time as well. So it's not a linear um, progression, it's a geometric progression. The implication of that is spend a lot of time planning and figure out as many problems as you possibly can because that's when they're cheap to fix. All right? Now, there's nothing you can do to change the shape of this curve. That's just the nature of the beast. It would be like if you're building a house, right? If you're building a house and you have a bathroom that is 
10 feet by 10 feet, and you decide, well, I don't want it 10 feet by 10 feet, I want it 12 feet by 12 feet. If you're doing that, if, you're, if you make that change when you're still planning out the house, it's pretty easy to go and change. And it's not really going to be as costly as if you've already built the house, you're living in it, and you decide you want to change it. At that point, you have to start knocking down walls and doing all kinds of stuff, right? So the further along in the process for software is the same like building a house. If you can catch uh, and make a correction in the planning stage, it's going to be much less expensive to, to catch than uh, after uh, later on in the process. All the things that we do as far as good software design is to sort of flatten this curve out, though. Because if you apply poor techniques, it's going to curve even sharper, and it's going to be more of an increase. All right. So let's look at the process that we're going to go through for this project. All this relates to sort of the planning phase of the process. All right, project overview. All right, your project, you are to create a small website. I promise I'm not going to read every word to you like I started out doing. Okay. My suggestion is to pick a topic that you're interested in, pick a topic that you like. It's more fun to do it that way, all right? I've had students that tell me they, they have no idea what to do their project on. If that's the case, talk to me. It's best to pick something that you're interested in. And if you can't uh, think of something like that, you know, we can chat for a few minutes and we can come up with something. The one thing that you want to be aware of is to not pick a topic that is too broad nor too narrow. You know. For example, if you were going to do a website on, you like sports, and you, so you want to do a website on sports, that's a real broad topic, right? It would take a whole lot of pages to, to cover that topic adequately. So what you might do is pick, pick a specific sport, pick a specific team, a specific player, something like that. You can narrow it down. By the same token, um, you can also sometimes pick a topic that's too narrow. Maybe something that you can make a nice web page about, but you couldn't really stretch out to make a complete site. So work with me. As soon as you have an idea for a project, it would be a good idea to run it past me. And then we can sort of decide um, if it is um, the right size or not. When you're done, you should have approximately six to eight pages. Yeah, I would say I think that's listed here. Your final project should contain six to eight pages, each containing a reasonable amount of content. So, like, not a not a site with like one sentence per page or something like that. You're welcome to think beyond the scope of the class. In other words, if you want to experiment with something that we haven't really talked about in this class, if you want to do some animation on your page, or you want to do um, some sort of CSS techniques that we have not done on this page, you're welcome to try that. 
all right? Um, so feel free to, to um, experiment on this. I mentioned it here there may be an opportunity to develop a site for a nonprofit. Um, there will likely not be that opportunity this semester. That varies from semester to semester. So I have it in the, uh, the assignment, but it depends on the semester. This semester, there, there more than likely will not be an opportunity to do that. The goal of the project, technically sound, well-designed, and effectively communicates the message that was intended. Okay. There'll be two parts to this. There'll be the design document, and there will be the final project. What we're going to talk about today is the final project, or, or I'm sorry, is the design document. The final project that you're going to turn in um, is going to be, uh, is simply going to be a collection of completed web pages with CSS, images, all the files. So the final project that you'll turn in like the last day of class is simply the, all the web pages that you created. The design document is what's going to be turned in um, uh, prior to that. All right, what's the design document consist of? going to consist of a document in Word or a PDF document or some standard document that I can read on any machine that's going to contain four parts and then a prototype. And we'll talk about the four parts and the prototype. The prototype, just think of as being rough drafts of your web pages. So those will be HTML and CSS files and images. Um, that um, are rough drafts of your web page. In other words, they're not completed, but they're started. They're, they're started enough for me to get an idea of what your page is going to look like. Your Word document is going to consist of four sections. The first section is the strategy section. The second one is the scope Third one is structure. And fourth one is skeleton. And then you have the prototype. Let's start with the first section, the strategy section. The one thing I hope that I've gotten across is that before you create a website, you need to know what your audience is. And you, do, you need to know and you need to be able to identify what the goals of the audience are. Now I say audience, but really, for every website, there isn't just one audience. There isn't just one sort of user that is going to be visiting the website. Even something like Barbie, all right? What might be different kinds of users that would be visiting Barbie's website? What's one kind of user? Yes. Parents, all right? That's one example. What would be another example? Kids. So parents whose kids like Barbies, kids who like Barbies. What might be a third example of a kind of user visiting the site? Maybe an investor? The one I was thinking of is a collector, someone that collects Barbies. You know, hey, the new Wonder Woman Barbie's coming out. Maybe I should order one. All right. Now, those grew, and you could do this for just about any website. 
All right. These groups have some goals in common, but they also might have some goals that are different. All right. Your job is to do your best to accommodate for the main groups of users that are visiting your site, their most critical goals. <coughs> All right. In order to do that, you first have to identify who the groups of those users are. All right. A college's website. What are groups of people that could be visiting a college's website? Prospective students. Another example? Parents of the students. Yes, parents of the college students. Right. Current. Current students. Community members. Colleges typically have a lot of cultural events on their campus, right? So you might, one might be interested in seeing uh, what's going on um, at the college. Like, you know, many colleges have film series or concerts, recitals, and so on. You might want to see those things. All right. Even among prospective students, there could be a break, right? There could be a subdivision, right? You have some students that are coming to college straight out of high school, right? They graduate high school and they're going to college. You could have some students that are displaced workers or people that are changing their careers or so on that are coming to uh, the college um, later on. You could have students that are very clear about what it is that they want to accomplish. You know, I want to go to college and uh, go to nursing school and I want to become a nurse. Or you might have some students that don't have a real good idea of what they want. Gee, I know I probably should go to college and I'm interested in computers, but I really don't know what I want to do with them. All right? These are all groups of people that would identify, uh, that, that would be uh, users of a site. And it's true, every human is an individual. But we can't design a website to serve the, the goals of 7 billion individuals, right? So therefore, we categorize our users into a handful of groups, all right? And we call those groups, we define what are called personas for those groups. Now, what is a persona? A persona is simply a, a, a fictional person that you're going to define. You're going to make up a person, like you're making up a character for a book. All right? You're going to give them a name. You might use a picture, just to give them a better idea of what that is like. And you're going to describe why that person is visiting the site and what it is they're after. There are some examples of personas that you can go and Google. to get uh, a better idea of what it is you're supposed to do. All right, here's an example of a persona. Someone made this person up. Picture of him. A little description. Description of his job function. And so on. Apparently, Tom is um, the manager, like, of an auto repair shop. <laughs> And uh, maybe this is, you know, maybe this uh, website is a uh, is an auto parts uh, supplier. You're supposed to use your imagination to visualize based on my brilliant description. Ah. But if you're having a hard time with that today, I will put that on the screen. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. 
Yeah, Tom Brody. Uh, a picture of Tom, a description of him, and so on. Now, this is really an elaborate persona. You don't really need to get this elaborate. All right. What do I want for you uh, when you create your personas? Really, what I want is this. I want. Picture is good. Use your friends. You know, use famous people and give them funny names. I, it's up to you. Do whatever you want. But a picture, a name, and a brief description of why they are using the site and what group of users they represent. So, for example, if I was doing a college website, I might say, Fred Jackson, Fred is a displaced worker who lost his job when his factory shut down. He is not sure what he wants to do. But knows he needs additional education. You know, his ultimate goal a new career. All right. That's a description of this user and this describes what sets them apart from the other users. So a picture, a name, a paragraph or two explaining the significance of this user. Another persona might be Jim who is a high school graduate who knows that uh, you know, he, he wants to uh, work helping people and he wants to get involved in the medical field as a, a, a radiology uh, tech. All right? Because he knows people in his family that have done that career and it seems to be a good career, it seems to be interesting, challenging, and pays reasonably well. All right? So that might be a second persona. Now again, for a large website like a college, you're going to have maybe a dozen personas. For your website, I only ask you to come up with three personas. So the first part of your strategy section will contain three personas that you think of. And again, a lot of times people think that that's hard to do. But again, it really isn't. Think of three different groups of people that are going to visit um, your site. If you had a website for a band, for example, you know, maybe one of the personas would be um, people that already know the band and like them. People that don't know about the band, but Maybe they saw they're going to appear locally in the next week or so, and they're trying to decide if they want to go see them. And then maybe a third persona would be someone that wants to hire the band for, uh, for uh, a performance or something like that. So it's, you should be able to come up with three personas regardless of what your topic is. All right? Now, for each of those personas, you're going to come up with three goals. So you're going to write a description of your site's topic and purpose. So, for example, you might say, I'm going to do a website for uh, the band such and such. Uh, they are a local band that plays classic rock, and they also perform weddings and at you know, coffee shops and bars and so on. Create three personas. So you'll create the three personas. Fred is a fan of the band. Mary doesn't know anything about the band, but might want to go, might want to go see them. And Janice is someone that might want to hire the band for 
uh, an upcoming performance. You'll come up with a list of three goals for the organization that is creating the site. So for example, the band that's creating the site, they're certainly creating the site to have for, for a reason, right? They might want to publicize their appearances and get greater attendance at their appearances. They might want to get booked for more shows. They might want to sell merchandise or sell CDs or sell downloads of their music. All right? So that might be the goals of the band for creating this site. The goals of the users then will be, uh, there'll be three goals for each user persona. Now there's going to be some overlap here, all right? Both a adult that is coming back to school and a high school student that's coming to a college are going to have some goals in common to understand about the cost and financial aid available, all right? Um, and so on. Now for some of the personas might have goals that the other personas don't have. For example, someone that is coming back to school that really isn't sure about what path they're going to take might be interested in what sort of career counseling is provided. Whereas someone that is sure they want to be a radiology tech, they don't really need the, the, uh, the, the career counseling. They already have a good idea of what it is they want to do. All right, so to summarize, the strategy part is going to have a paragraph that says what your site is going to be about, uh, just a very high overview, a description of three user personas, three representative people, representative of the different groups that are going to be visiting your site. You're going to list three goals of you as the creator of the site, and then you're going to list three goals for each of the user personas. It should look professional, it should be done in Word, and read like a report one would give their boss, not merely a list of things. Each user persona should uh, be on its own page and should have uh, an actual photo. Remember to respect copyright law. So if you take a photo offline, um, then uh, put a credit of where you got the photo from. If it's an image uh, that you took yourself of a friend and you're using them as a persona, you can just say, you know, you know, I own the copyright to this image, I took this image, or whatever. The strategy part is really, again, a critical, important part of the process, right? Remember I said that a well-designed site is a site where the users can easily accomplish their goals. Well, how could you develop a site for the users to easily accomplish their goals if you don't know what those goals are? And how can you develop the goals if you don't have an idea of who the users are? So you first have to identify who your main groups of users are, define their goals, and then you have a fighting chance of developing a website that's actually going to work. All right. Any questions about this part of the process? The second part of the process, I'll introduce this today and, and we'll, we'll finish it up on Tuesday next week, is the scope process. And the scope process is where you identify specific pieces of content that will help your users achieve their goals. All right? So, one of the goals of a displaced worker coming back to college might be to get some career counseling. Well, an item in the scope would be that your site is going to have a page or a section of pages or whatever devoted to career counseling. All right? And those could include uh, things like um, 
you know, uh, who to see on campus, how to, how, to, how to find what courses are offered and what programs are offered and so on. So you're going to have one piece of content or maybe multiple pieces of con uh, content to, um, to help that user get the career counseling that they need. Another goal of a displaced worker might be to ease their apprehension about going back to school. All right. So maybe you would have a special page for the displaced worker that lists some of the resources that are available on campus that can help them out. The counselors and advisors, financial aid office, tips for people returning to school, a discussion of how school might be different now than it was so many years ago, all right, and so on. In the strategy section, you decide the goals that you have and the goals that your users have. You identify these. In the scope section, you decide what specific pieces of content you're going to put on the page that's going to help achieve those goals. So the two are tied together. The scope or the strategy, you define the goals. The scope is how you're going to address those goals. So, for example, a band that wants to get uh, more people coming to their shows. What are some pieces of content they could put on their website that might help address that goal? A band that wants more people to come to their shows. What are some things a band could put? Yeah. A schedule. A schedule. Right. Can't go to a performance if you don't know where they're going to be performing. So a schedule that says, hey, Friday we're going to be this place, next Saturday we're going to be this place, and so on. So the goal is to get more people to come to their performances. The item in the scope section, the actual individual requirement will be that the site will have a schedule of the band's upcoming appearances. What might be another piece of content that a, a band might put? Exactly. Links to social media so that, you know, a, a person can follow them on Facebook so that they can get that stuff right in their feed and they don't have to go out and, and search for it. That would be an excellent idea. All right. What's something else that a, a band could do? Yes. Little snippets of their songs. Maybe audio, maybe video. All right to show how much fun people have at their performances so that that will make people want to go. So there's three things that we thought of off the top of our heads of three specific pieces of content that we could put on our site that addresses a goal. All right. Now, it's not necessarily going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence. One goal might have several requirements that, um, that address that goal. One requirement might belong to several goals as well. For example, putting a little clip of the band might help the band get more people coming to their shows, and it might help a person that doesn't know anything about this band decide if they want to go see them or not. So that might be a goal of one persona of trying to decide, gee, am I going to like this band or not? That's the goal I have for visiting their site. And so a video clip might help them decide that. All right. So goals are what wants to be accomplished, what needs to be accomplished. Scope are the individual items that you're going to put on the website to help achieve those goals. Now every goal that you define, you better have at least one requirement that belongs to it. Right? So if one of the goals is to sell more merchandise for the band, if I don't have a link that tells people about the merchandise that's available or gives them the opportunity to order merchandise or whatever, then I've missed the boat because I've defined a goal, I've defined something that's of, of high importance to the band, and yet I haven't put anything on the site to achieve that. So for every goal that you have, you better have at least one piece of content, one requirement that goes along with that. And the reverse is true as well. If you put something on your website, it should belong to one of the goals. Otherwise, it's just clutter. Why have it there? All right. Um, if you were to put 
on, uh, on the website what your lead singer had for breakfast. All right? Well, that probably doesn't address any of the goals. Unless you're one of those bands that have a very obsessive group of fans that want to know every little thing about that band. In which case, yeah, maybe it does solve the goal. Again, it all depends on the audience and their goals. So, relevant content, the look of the page, the organization of the page, all depends on who the audience is. That's why that's done right off in the first set, is identify those personas, identify who's going to be visiting the site, and then you can start making decisions about the goals that you want to solve and about what content you're going to have on the site. All right, we'll wrap up the discussion of the design document next time, and we'll continue on from there. Are there any questions at this point? All right, we'll see you over in lab.